Stanford University. All right, lecture seven, Stanford CS193P, spring of 2020. Today, we're briefly gonna talk about colors and images, just a couple of minutes. Then we're gonna dive into our main topic today, which is multi-threaded programming. And then we're gonna have a humongous demo. And this demo is gonna cover a lot of ground. We're gonna somewhat review MVVM by just developing a completely separate app from scratch. And that way you can compare and contrast that app with Memorize and it helps you understand MVVM better. And then we're gonna talk about a bunch of miscellaneous topics. And of course we will demo multi-threading since that's our main topic of today. So colors and images, let's talk about colors first. There is a struct called color, as you know, we've been using it so far. And there's another thing called UI color. And you might wonder why are these two things that are just named so similarly? Well, a color, as we learned, and we talked about this in the forums actually, it can kind of play different roles. It can be a color specifier, like foreground color, color green, or it can also be a shape style, fill color blue. And it can even be a view. We haven't seen this in any of our demos so far, but it can be a view, color dot white. You can have that appear anywhere a view appears. It's quite strange. And it's not like kind of you get a rectangle filled with white when you do that. Now, due to color's multifaceted role where it can do all these different things, it has somewhat limited API, mostly just creating colors. And I think it has some stuff where you can compare colors, but it's pretty, pretty limited. So there's this other thing, UI color. This is the thing where you're actually going to manipulate colors. You're going to interrogate the color. What's your RGB value? And it's got a lot more system colors and pre-built in colors. This is a much more powerful color class than this color thing. Now, it's not a chameleon. It just is a little container that represents a color and it represents it in a very powerful way, but that's what it is. And if I'm ever gonna do any color manipulation, which you are gonna do, by the way, in your assignment five, to, not next week, but the week after, you're gonna to wanna to use UI color. But the great thing is once you built the UI color and transformed or do whatever you wanna to do to it to make it way, the way you want, now you can just say color, UI color colon, and specify that color, and you can use it in all the ways above as a specifier, a view, whatever. UI color starts with UI. That's because it comes from the old pre Swift UI world, things that start with UI or from UI kit. But it was so good at manipulating colors, eh, they just brought it into Swift UI, just like it was. Now a similar sort of dichotomy happened with image and UI image. So image in Swift UI is primarily a view. It's a view that displays an image. It's not a something that you would make a var of type image and it holds an image, it is a view. So this image view, you can specify what image you want it to display in a number of ways. One way is by just giving it a string and it will use that as the name of an image that it finds in your assets.xc assets file. If you look in Xcode where all your files are, there's a file we haven't talked about in there, assets.xc assets, Xcode assets. And if you look at it, you'll see that it's just a place to store images in lots of different formats. Then you can get them by name by saying image of the name. That's the, kind of the most basic way to access an image. There are also though a ton of system images. And you get this one by saying image system name colon and then the name. Now, how do you find out what all these are? Well, you're gonna to need to download an app from developer.apple.com slash design called SF Symbols. And it has all of them listed. You can search through them by name. The names pretty much encapsulate what they are. When you're there, by the way, at developerapple.com slash design, there's a document you'll see right on that page called the Human Interface Guidelines. You really wanna read that document. I really should have made it reading assignment number four. I might go back and still do that, but you should read it. It's an absolute must read if you ever wanna do an app store submission. It talks about how your UI is supposed to do certain things so that all UIs in all apps are doing these things in the same way and the user gets a consistent experience super important not just to read that document to really understand all the things that are in it so when you go to write your app and submit it to the app store it doesn't get rejected for violating these human interface guidelines if you use this system 
name images, by the way, you can control how large they are with the image scale view modifier. It's a little bit hidden there because you don't do it on somewhere in the image itself. It's actually a view modifier. So go take a look at that. And also just a quick note that system images are really good to use as masks. So like if you have a gradient, you can have it shine through the system image and that can give you some really cool effects. So UI image, that's the thing that if you had a var that was gonna hold an image in it, like a JPEG image, it would be of type UI image. Again, comes from UI kit. It was so good at handling images, there was just no reason to try and duplicate it all in the image view. And so they just brought it in and UI image can do multiple file formats, JPEGs, GIF, PNGs. It has transformation primitive scaling, all these things. It can do animated images, all that. And once you've built a UI image up to what you want from whatever JPEG file or whatever you built it from, then you can say image UI image colon, the UI image and present it as a view. So similar kind of with color and UI color, image and UI image. All right, main thing of the day, multi-threading. Now, multi-threading can be used to build systems of parallel computing where you've got an app and it's doing multiple things at the same time. Maybe they depend on each other and you wanna manage those dependencies, but all these things. But we're only gonna talk about multi-threading in this class in one very important niche that it can satisfy, which is not blocking the UI. And we're going to not block the UI by having all the stuff that would block the UI on a different thread of execution. Now, it is never okay for your UI to be blocked. If someone reaches with their finger to scroll something or tap on a button, your UI has to be ready to do it. It cannot be saying, oh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm off doing something else for a second or so, I'll be right back. It has to instantly do it. But sometimes you need to do those slow things. You need to do some huge machine learning calculation or something, or you need to go out over the network and that's gonna take time. There's just no avoiding that time. So how during that time are you gonna not block your UI? Well, we're gonna do that by using different threads of execution. Now, I'm gonna assume most of you know what a thread is, but I'll just quickly talk about it. Most modern operating systems have this ability to say this code should execute, execute on its own thread of execution, and then you can have multiple threads of execution, all executing simultaneously. Now, they may not actually be executing simultaneously. You know, if you have multiple core processors or multiprocessors, then it, they might be, but sometimes you just have a single core or not enough cores, and so it's actually switching back and forth between them really quickly, not doing it, but you don't care about any of that. To you, it just appears that you've got different pieces of code executing simultaneously. They're running at the exact same time somehow, madly. Now, this can be a little bit complicated to manage in terms of as a programmer deciding, well, this one wants to be running on this thread of execution, this one over here. So we really need some help in making this multi-threaded code readable and understandable by mere mortals like us. And we need this because it's time, this thing about things running at the same time adds this fourth dimension to our code that's hard for us to grok. Swift solves this complexity issue using something called queues. Now a queue is nothing more than a bunch of blocks of code that are sitting in line, just patiently waiting to get a thread of execution that will go and run them. Now, and by queue, I mean the same thing as queue, like a queue at the movies, or at least Q used to be at the movies before they closed all the movie theaters for coronavirus, but you know, a, a line where people are standing in line, same thing here. These are just blocks of code waiting in line to get executed. So in Swift, we don't think about threads. We don't even think about them. All we think about is queues. We let the system come up with all the threads and all that stuff to take things off these queues and execute them. That's up to the system. All we think about is the queues and the blocks of code we wanna plop on those queues. We specify these blocks of code that go on the queues using closures, functions as arguments. We'll see how this works, what the code looks for, like this, for this, but let's quickly talk about queues and what queues are available first. And the most important queue in all the world of iOS is called the main queue. 
Now this is the queue that has all the blocks of code on it that have anything to do with UI. Anytime you want to do something in the UI, you have to use the main queue. It is absolutely unequivocally an error to do UI in any block of code that is not executing, that not, was not chosen from the main queue. So when you tap on screen, that is going to execute code on the main queue. When you do anything that draws in the UI in any way, it's going to get initiated from the main queue. There is some stuff like animation where all the calculations of the animation, the interframe, the animatable data that we did, and that is going to happen in another queue off the main queue, but it's all going to get coordinated back onto the main queue to do the drawing. So the stuff all happens without smashing into each other. So where do we do the long live stuff then, the non UI stuff? Well, the best place to do it is in this pile of background queues that the system makes available to you. So this is where we're going to do anything that's going to take a long time, like a network call or some, like I said, machine learning or some other analysis that's going to take, you know, more than a millisecond or so to do. The system has, it manages a bunch of threads to go pull blocks of code off of these background queues and run them for you. So things that you put on these background queues, they all seem to almost be running simultaneously. And of course, they're running simultaneously with what's on the main queue. But of course, the main queue always gets higher priority. If someone taps or if you put your own block of code on this main queue, it's going to run much more quickly and with more attention than anything on these background queues. The whole system that does all this is called Grand Central Dispatch because it's dispatching the code from the queues to be executed by the threads. And it has a number of different functions in there in Grand Central Dispatch, but really it boils down to these two fundamental tasks that you're doing with GCD. One, it's getting a queue, and two, plopping a block of code on the queue. And that's pretty much 99% of what GCD is about. There's more stuff in there coordinating when things are happening on multiple queues, but it, for our purposes, especially for the purposes of keeping long lived things off of the UI main queue, these are the two main things we need. So let's talk about the first of these two things, which is creating or getting access to a queue. Now, the first one is simple. That's the main queue. You're just going to use this symbol dispatch queue.main, right? Main is a static function in the struct dispatch queue. And that is the queue you're going to use whenever you want to draw in the UI. Couldn't be simpler. That's all you do. What about all the background queues? For that one, you're going to call this static function in dispatch queue called global, which takes an argument QOS, which is quality of service, which is kind of like priority. Essentially, how much do we want the system to pay attention to the blocks of code on this queue? And the four options you have here are user interactive. This is for things like you're in the middle of dragging something across the screen and you need to calculate something. It might take a little bit, so you can't make the drag be jaggy, but you need that information now. So this is a super high priority queue. It's going to get serviced a lot. Then there's user initiated. Here you're not in the middle of a drag, but the user did just tap on something, do this for me, and so you need to do this right now. Then there's utility, which is the user didn't just ask for this, but it, it needs to be done. So this is pretty high priority, but it's not like the user just clicked a button and wants this done now. And then there's background, which is really low priority. This is, you know, I'm cleaning up my database of old corrupt or something that's going on in the background. It really has nothing to do with what the user perceives to be their app, but it's something my app needs to do to have proper operation or whatever. And that's it. That's how you get a queue, super easy. GCD you're gonna find is amazingly simple. And it's really simple to get a hold of a queue. You're either gonna do the main queue or one of these global background queues. The second thing is plopping a closure onto a queue. So how are we gonna do that? Well, let's say I have my queue, either the main queue or one of these global queues. And I'm either going to call this function async or the function sync on that queue. And the argument is just a closure. And it's a function that takes no arguments and returns no arguments. And inside there, I'm going to put whatever code I want to be executed on that queue. 
Now, the second one of these, the dot sync, blocks. So it blocks and waits till that queue, the green queue right there, it waits until it has taken this block of code off of its queue and executed it to completion, then it's going to continue. So we would never call queue.sync in UI code because it would block the UI. In fact, it's rare to call this dot sync at all. So we're almost always using dot async, which means just take this block of code, throw it on this other queue, and just keep going. And so that means that whatever's in the curly braces there, it's going to be executed sometime in the future. I don't know when, it's whenever that queue gets around to it. Now, hopefully, if that's the main queue, it's going to be pretty soon, but even that's not a locked solid guarantee. So your code has to be tolerant of, tolerant of the fact that when you say queue.async blah, whatever's in the blah might not be executed for you know, many milliseconds, possibly even longer. So that's a little bit of thinking to have to comprehend that as you write your code. But async is the one we usually do. We're just plopping these blocks of code onto these other queues to get them to get executed. Um, besides async and sync, there are some other ones, uh, async after, which will do the async, but after a little delay so that you can wait to have it executed. But mostly we're going to be doing async. Beauty of this GCD API, when you combine these two things, having a queue and async to plop it on there, is when you are nesting these things inside of each other. Let's look at an example here. So I'm doing dispatch queue global user initiated. So this is something user asked me to do, but I'm going to do it on a background thread, not in on the main queue. So I'd call that async with a block of code. And in that block of code at the beginning, I'm going to be doing something might, that might take a very long time. Maybe I'm accessing something on the network or doing some calculation. And it's fine to do because I'm not doing this code. This curly brace that has started right there is not doing something on the main queue. So that's fine. I can do take as long as I want right here. But this long time thing that we're doing, when it comes back, maybe it's going to require a change to the UI. Maybe I fetched an image and now I want to put that image on the UI. But we can't do that UI here because we are currently on one of these global background queues. We can't do UI on this queue. So this code that we posted async to that queue can't do UI here. But that's no problem. Let's just turn around and post a block of code that does do the UI thing back on the main queue, and the main queue eventually will get through its queue and get to this one and execute it. And again, the main queue, high priority, probably not going to take long. It might be nothing on the queue when you put it on there, and boom, it just runs really quickly. But the, conceptually, the point is we're taking this block code and telling the main queue, hey, you go run this thing. And so we can do UI in there. This makes asynchronous code almost look synchronous, but they're not quite. First outer block there, the outer yellow dispatch queue async, is, could take a long time. And so that inner one might not be happening for 10 seconds. And what if the user is like totally navigated away from this in their UI? They're just not even interested. It took so long, now they don't even care anymore. And then you come back and you're like, oh, now I want to put this image up. But the user doesn't care about that image anymore. They're off doing something else in the app. That's why I'm saying you have to think a little bit about the time, but at least it makes it read from a conceptual standpoint, it looks almost like synchronous code right here. This dispatch queue.main.async that we saw, you're gonna often do that. And it, the reason you're gonna often do that when you're doing asynchronous programming is you're gonna be doing things in the background that are gonna result in things that are gonna affect the UI. And so you're gonna have to dispatch main async back to the UI to do the UI results of those things. However, you're not actually going to call dispatch queue.global QoS very often. Why aren't you going to call that very much? Well, that's because there are higher level APIs for managing this background activities that you're going to be calling. For example, if you wanted to fetch an image over the network, which we're going to do by doing dispatch global in the demo later today, but if you wanted to do it, you really would use this thing called URL session. So URL session is a struct and it takes the information about the URL you want and it goes off and it puts something on the global QoS queues to go do that. But you have to be a little careful here because URL session also takes an argument, which is a closure you give it to execute when the image comes back. 
that closure is also going to be executed by URL session on this dispatch global queue. So you can't do UI in there. So whenever you're using something like URL session, you give it a closure that says, hey, go fetch this. And when you're done, call this closure. That closure is almost certainly going to be doing dispatch queue main.async inside of it to dispatch some code back to the main queue to put the UI result of whatever was fetched by the URL session. Now, again, today, I want you to understand GCD. So that's why we're going to do the dispatch queue global ourselves. And then we're going to do a dispatch queue main async ourselves. But in the real world, if I was fetching an image, which is what we're doing in our demo, I'd use URL session. All right, so let's get to that demo right away. I already talked about what we're going to be doing, so let's do it. This demo is a pretty big one. We are going to do a whole nother app from scratch. That way you can compare and contrast what you saw us do in Memorize versus a completely different app. And then hopefully all the things you did in Memorize won't seem so, you know, Memorize specific. You'll see which ones of them are just general things that we're doing in every app versus those the specific things. Let me show you what this app is going to look like before we get started here. It's called Emoji Art, and it lets us build some sort of art here out of emojis, of course, because we love emojis. And across the top, you can see we have some emojis to choose from to build out of, and we can even choose different kinds of emojis, activities, animals, whatever. Uh, these lists of emojis are editable by the user. If they click on here, they can actually remove emojis from there or even click on here and go to the emoji keyboard and add more emojis, maybe add another face in here or whatever. And you use these emojis to build your art, but of course it's nice to have a good background. So I've gone over here to Google. By the way, this right here is the iPad multi-app user interface here where I've got my emoji art on the left and I've got Safari on the right. And I can drag Safari completely away up I want, just leaving my emoji art. Or go down here and grab Safari and drag it back out again and then resize it to whatever size that I want. I'm going to choose my background here by using drag and drop. Here I have searched for my favorite thing here, countryside cartoons. And just looking around here for all the countryside cartoons on the internet. And I'm just going to pick one here and lift it up. And you see when I drag it over, it gets that little green plus sign in the corner. And if I drop, then it adds it as the background. We're going to be making it so you can zoom in here or we could pan around a little bit then we can add our emoji. So let's see, let's uh, see if we can find, here's a bicyclist. So we'll just pick up Mr. Bike, bicyclist right here, put him on the road. He's a little small, so I'm gonna select him and then make him bigger. And of course we'd like some nature as well. Let's go find some animals. Oh, bee, one of my favorite things in nature is a bee. Or it would be B without bees. And maybe we'll add some perspective to this by having some of the bees seem to be closer to us and some of the bees farther away. So our goal is to build this app. Now today, all we're going to do is put this little thing up here. We're not going to have a chooser that lets us choose different kinds. We're just going to have one row of emoji up here. And we also want to be able to drag and drop to do our background. And we also want to be able to pick up these emojis and drop them in there. Then your homework for next week is going to be to be able to select them and then resize these emojis or to move them around. And then next week, we're also going to add this little chooser up here and make it so that these documents persist. Because right now, if I quit this app and went back in, I'd lose my document. So we obviously want to be able to save documents. And so we've got a lot of work to do with this app, but let's get started today with the, the basics of it. So this is a completely brand new project, of course. Now, you don't have to follow along. You won't be asked to do that in your homework like you were the first two weeks. But again, it's always recommended as a learning exercise to follow along. So let's get started here by clicking New Project. We always pick single view app in this class. I'm going to call this thing emoji art, right? Everything else the same as we have for memorize. And I'm going to put it in developer right here, same place that I'm putting my memorize. 
And here it is. Let's make a lot of space so we can see our code very clearly. We'll even add a little small there. But let's dive right in. You already know the basics of how to do things here. So let's start by making our uh, view model. So I'm just going to go up here, File, New, File. And uh, it's a Swift file, right? Part of the UI, but not a view itself. So let's make sure we put it in the right place. And I'm going to call my uh, view model here Emoji Art Document because my view model is going to represent one document, one Emoji Art Document. And you could imagine someday uh, having a UI in my Emoji Art that would let me open different documents, and each one would be represented with its own view model. View models, of course, are UI, so we're going to import Swift UI, and they're also classes, so we're going to have this emoji art document be a class, and we always do observable object for our view models because they're the thing that manage this reactiveness between things change in the model, and we see them in the UI. Now that we have a view model, let's go back to our view, which is this content view right here with this default content view business. And I'm gonna put my view model here. So I'm gonna have observed object bar. Now I'm not gonna call it view model. That's what we called it before. I'm gonna call it something we would actually call it, uh, in this case, document. And that's an emoji art document. We're not gonna do preview right off the bat here. Our emoji art view is pretty much all about the things that are dragged into it. And of course, in the preview, window we can't drag it in there but eventually we probably would want to put that preview back and have maybe some test data of some emojis in a background so that we could see to make sure that thing it looks good but for demo purposes here we'll just turn that off for now and I don't like this name content view right here that's bad so let's do the same thing we did before command click on this and say rename and now it's kind of searching for all the places you can see it here that this appears. And so I'm going to rename this to be emoji art document view because it's going to be a view that shows a document. And we can see uh, it's not going to rename that. It's okay, we'll have to do that ourselves. It's up here. And of course, we've got to change, look at the places where this is called and make sure we create a view model for these things. And we know that's over here in our scene delegate. Content view equals emoji art document view. And we'll have the document be, for now, just a default emoji art document, an empty document. Doesn't have anything in it. And it's okay for us to do this initializer with no arguments, because if we look at our emoji art document, it has no uninitialized variables. So it's perfectly fine to do init that way. All right. So let's start building our UI right off the bat. And our UI, if you recall, has this emoji at the top. So let's try and build this little nice scrollable list of emoji there. Let's see if we can do that. Now that scrollable list of emoji, that palette at the top, that's shared by all documents. So that does not want to be a var in an instance of the document, because remember an instance of this view model represents one document. That wants to be a static var. And in fact, for now, we're gonna make it a static let, this palette of emoji. And well, we'll just put some random things in here for now. We know how to add emojis, we'll go here. Sure, put a star in there, some clouds. What else we got down here? Apple, yeah, maybe uh, Earth. And what else we got? Uh, pretzel. Yeah, and I don't want to make you hungry, so I won't put any food in there. But maybe like a baseball, that kind of thing. All right, so this is just going to be our default palette. Eventually, this is going to become an array of palettes so that we can have that the nice chooser right here where we can choose between these palettes but for now we're not we don't have that feature and so now that we have this palette let's just make our document view instead of saying hello world let's have it display that now this should be something you can kind of instantly imagine how we're going to do we're just going to make an h stack of four each and the four each is going to be those emoji art document that static palette and then for each of the emojis in there, we want to just put a text of the emoji. Now, this doesn't quite work because this is a string. And for each, remember, wants an array, uh, either a range of ints or it wants an array of identifiable things. And so a string is not an array. It's close. 
But there's a great little function on string called map, which will turn it into an array by calling a function, which we're going to call string zero here. And this function takes each character in the string. So dollar zero is a character in this string. And it just, we're going to apply this function to it. We're just going to turn it into a string. So string knows how to take a single character and turn it into a string. And so now we have four each on an array of strings. This map returns an array of strings. So that's cool. And that means this emoji is going to be a string, but still not working. We're getting the dreaded, oh, expected range of int. And we know why that is. For each takes an array of identifiable, and strings are not identifiable. Now, it's interesting. We could put an extension on string to make it identifiable like this, just by doing var id. And I have a cool way to do that. I'm going to have the ID be a string. I'm just going to return myself. Okay, I'm a string. Strings are equatable. By the way, this don't care for the ID and identifiable. It's not complete don't care. Obviously, this ID has to be equatable. You have to be able to say equals equals on it. Otherwise, I can't tell if two identifiable things are the same. But a string, you can certainly do equals equals on. So this is fine. But what's this error that I'm getting? property ID must be declared public because it matches a requirement in a public protocol identifiable. Well, identifiable is indeed a public protocol and string is a public class. So that makes us have to mark this also as public. Now, what does public mean? We have not seen the access control public. We saw private and private set, but we haven't seen public. Public means non-private in a library. Identifiable and string are clearly in the Swift UI imported library right here. And so they have to mark things that they want people outside the library to actually be able to see with public. Now, you're not going to be doing libraries in this class, so you're never going to mark anything public. But if one day you do work on a library, you'll know what public is all about there. Now, this does work, you see, no errors, right? This is now an array of identifiables because strings are identifiables, but this is also wrong. Okay? We really wouldn't want to make strings identifiable throughout our entire app. That's really, we only want them to be identifiable right here. And for each understands that you're sometimes going to pass an array of something that you don't, you can't make it conform to identifiable. So it has a nice little extra argument you can specify called ID. Now ID lets you specify which var on these things to use to uniquely identify it. So it's essentially like use this var as the ID as if this thing were identifiable, which is really, really convenient. Now the var that I'm going to use in, in string is dot self. Okay, so every object essentially has a var you can't see called self and that is itself so that's a great identifier for a string but what is this syntax right here backslash dot self this is called a key path in swift and a key path is just a really cool simple syntax to be able to specify a var on another object so here this is backslash means this is a key path and dot means on this thing right here this class of things string self and I could press any you know any var I could even say like this foo dot bar and call a var that returns something then call a var on that it's a pretty flexible little system this little key path oriented stuff but you can see that fixes everything right here so let's run it and see what we got here and let's not run it on an iPhone so this app that we're doing right here is going to be an iPad app I'm going to make it primarily for the iPad, we're going to find that because of the power of Swift UI, it's going to work quite well on the iPhone as well. But we're going to develop it on the iPad first. We drag and drop and all these things we want over here. So there it is. You know, there's still Safari here. And now we're running our version of Emoji Art over here. So we lost all the stuff that uh, I was showing you before. But here they are. Look at that. Oh, those are emojis. Now, well, our emojis have a little bit of some problems here. One, they're really small, and we want them to be scrollable. So let's go fix some of these things. The smallness, we know how to fix that. We're just going to say dot font, and we'll use a system font uh, of size. And I'm going to be a good program here and actually make a little let down here, probably a private let, called my default emoji size. 
it's going to be CG float. I'm going to say 40. I think I tried that out and it seemed pretty good. So let's say self dot default emoji size right here. That'll make it big. Let's see what that looks like. Ooh, okay, definitely much better. That's closer to what we were having before. What about the scrollability? I'm dragging on this. It's not scrolling back and forth here. That's super easy and swift. So this is so easy. I was thinking of having slides on this and how to do scroll views, but it's so easy. It's really hardly even worth having a slide over. You just put it in a scroll view and the scroll view will let you specify whether it scrolls horizontally or vertically or both. So our scroll view obviously only scrolls horizontally. We just wrap this in there and that's all we have to do. Now this H stack that we had is going to be scrollable. You see, I can scroll it around. And one thing I don't like, it's kind of close to the edge right there. I want a little bit of room. We know how to do add a little bit of room to things. So let's take this scroll view and add a little padding. And I'm only going to do padding horizontally. You've probably gathered by now the padding has a lot of different arguments you can specify exact paddings on just some edges or default paddings or whatever this is going to give me the default paddings but only on the left and right um, i probably want the vertically i want this thing uh, to use as little space as possible so i don't really want padding there because i want my document to be as big as possible Speaking of my document, let's get my document on there and have this push up to the top and my document use all the rest of the space over there. Until we write the code that actually does a document that can have a background and have all those emojis on there, I'm just going to use a yellow rectangle to be my document. So I'm going to put it in a V stack here with this scroll view that we just built for the emoji and a rectangle that is foreground color yellow. And well, that's pretty darn close to already looking exactly what I want. Okay, I've got my scrollable list of emoji up here. We could have any amount of emoji we wanted. And here's my document. Only thing is I really don't want this white line down here. Why is this not yellow all the way to the bottom? And it's not yellow all the way to the bottom because it's only drawing this yellow in the safe area, what's called the safe area of this view. And it considers this little area down here not safe because it's got this little, you see this little uh, bar right here? That's the bar that you use if you want to switch to other apps in iPad. And so it considers that an adornment that's always on the screen. By default, it doesn't draw over that in case there's something critical that your app is drawing behind it. But our app, we're going to be able to zoom and pan around. So if there was some critical emoji underneath this bar, we just move it, uh, move our document out of the way a little bit. So we do want to move to the edges right there. And in general, in iOS, when we are building apps, content is king. We want to use as much of space as possible for our content and as little space as possible for adornments. Okay, these little things like that, or, or like or even our emoji here, we want to try and keep that kind of small so we have this huge space for our document. So how do we tell SwiftUI? Yeah, go ahead, use these unsafe areas like this little thing right here. By the way, the notch on the iPhone is also an unsafe area. So if we want to use that, that is no problem. We're just going to go to our rectangle here and say edges ignoring the safe area are and i'm going to do the horizontal edges left and right and also the bottom edge so i can do multiple areas to ignore here so let's see what that looks like we do we want to make that yellow rectangle be our document so we need a model for that document now our model for that document is just going to be the background and then all the emoji and where they are and what size they are. That is, that's the entire model. Now don't get confused here and maybe just because you did memorize and you had themes, you might be a little th wondering what's going on here. Yes, the model for an emoji art document is representing a visual thing, the emoji art uh, itself, but it's not itself a UI element it's still a kind of device independent representation of an emoji art document it's up to some ui like swift ui to turn it into something that we can draw and i'm going to emphasize this by making the coordinates of these emojis and the size 
be ints. And clearly, Swift UI doesn't work in ints. It works in CG floats, right? Floating point numbers. But I'm going to make them ints just so you can be really seeing the difference between my model, which is this device independent, UI independent representation of it, and my UI. So let's go create that model. I'm going to go File New here. And uh, it is a model, so it's Swift File. It's all in the right places. I'm going to call my model Emoji Art. That is what my model is. It's an Emoji Art. Here it is. I'm not going to change to Swift UI here. Just going to import Foundation. It's a simple struct called Emoji Art, and it has this background URL. I'm going to store you the URL for the background. It's going to be of type URL, optional URL though. This URL is just a Swift library struct that holds a URL like HTTPS colon slash slash, that is a URL, and it holds it. It also can hold file URLs in there. And the reason I'm making this optional is that our documents obviously start out with no background. And it's actually valid to have an emoji art document with no background. It would just be probably white or something. It wouldn't look that good maybe, but uh, we're certainly it's certainly legal, so that's why I'm going to make this an optional. The other thing is the emojis. So the emojis are just going to be some array, array of emojis of some sort. So I'm going to have to have a struct emoji that represents the emojis, just like we had card and memorize. Here we happen to have emojis in our emoji art. And what is in an emoji? The, obviously the text, right? The actual emoji, like the smiley face or whatever. It's got position. And I told you I'm going to do position using ints. Take note here, by the way, that I'm going to have the coordinate system of this X and Y have 0, 0 right in the center of my document. And that's different from iOS's coordinate system. You'll remember from when we did our pi that that coordinate system is 0, 0 in the upper left. But I'm going to have X and Y here be in the center. And note that because later on, when we're working in our view, we're going to have to convert from this coordinate system of our model, which is 0, 0 is the center, to our iOS coordinate system, 0, 0 upper left. It's also got a size. I'm going to do that with an int as well. Notice that I made the text be a let. Once you create an emoji in emoji art, like a smiley face or a panda or a bicycle or whatever, it is going to always be that. We're never going to allow you to change that emoji. And that's just the decision I made. And I make that decision. I express that decision by having this be a let. Now, we can already anticipate that in our UI, this emoji is going to want to be identifiable. They're clearly, we're going to have to for each through our emojis and show them all on screen. So I'm going to make this identifiable, and that requires us to do this var ID. Now, what is our ID going to be? In our memorized game, we made it be like pretty much which pair it is. Like the first pair, it was 0 and 1. The second pair, it was 2 and 3. And here, we don't really have that kind of pairs or anything like that to use. There is something that we often use for IDs called UUID. This is a very unique identifier in the universe. I, it's unique. That's a little bit of overkill for uh, the emojis in emoji art. I can have hundreds of emojis in an emoji art and I can have hundreds of emoji art documents. So this is a lot of these generating these unique IDs kind of for nothing. And really, this ID also only needs to be identifiable and unique within this document. We are not going to need to identifiably see emoji across many documents. So I'm going to actually have this be an int, which I'm going to manage in this struct. And so it's going to be privately managed. Only emoji art is going to know what makes this int, how we make this int. But of course, identifiable is a public thing, so people will be able to look at the int. And since we only want anyone to ever look at this value, we can certainly make it a let. But what we need to do now is every time this is created, I give it a unique ID. And that is going to be done with a little private var called unique emoji ID. It's just going to be an int. And I'm going to add a function called add emoji. And all add emoji is going to do is add an emoji by appending a new emoji, which I'm going to create with the standard constructor there. And the unique ID as the ID. Now, of course, I need to 
keep this unique ID being unique. So each time someone does this, I'm going to say unique emoji ID plus equals one. That way it's changing all the time and always being unique. Now this is great, but you can see I've got errors here all over the place. The left side of mutating operator is immutable, self is immutable, self is immutable. And yes, this is a function that mutates self, right? It changes this guy. So we need to mark this as a mutating bunk. Now this strategy of doing this unique emoji ID will work great as long as everyone always adds emojis by calling add emoji. But what if someone creates an emoji with their own ID and then adds it right here to this array. That could be bad, especially if they choose an ID that's the same as some other one we chose with that emoji. Now you might think private set, right? Private set ought to fix this problem because that makes it so the emojis can only be written by us. But I actually don't want that because some of these emoji things like the position and the size, I do want people to set those. They can set them all they want, move the emojis around as much as they want. So I really can't use private set here like I did in Memorize. So how am I going to protect this from happening where people are adding emoji, not calling this? I'm gonna do that in an interesting way. In emoji here, I'm going to define an init, and it's gonna have all the same arguments as the standard init that you get for free for a struct. Now, how does this help the problem? In fact, this seems like a big waste. I get this for free, why would I do this at all? And the reason I'm gonna do it is because I'm gonna make this init private. By making this init private, now nobody can create an emoji, except for emoji itself, kind of not useful here. Even emoji art though, can't create it. So it does protect against someone else creating an emoji and putting in here, but it's protecting emoji art from doing it too. I'm going to show you a way around that with a different kind of access control called file private. File private makes this private in this file. And that gives emoji art the power to call this and create this, but no one outside this file can do it. So now we've protected against that case where someone creates an emoji and puts it in here without going through our nice unique emoji ID, since there's no way for them to create an emoji. All right, so that's it basically for our model. Our model is very simple. Let's go over to our view model over here and add this as a published private var. And again, I could call it model, but I'm not going to. I'm gonna call this my emoji art. It's of type emoji art. And let's just set it to a empty emoji art with no background and no emoji to start with. And it's published because every time the emoji art changes, of course, we need to use our observable object mechanism to cause our view to redraw. And it's private because I'm going to be a very good little view model here and do one of my jobs, which is to interpret the model for the view. So I'm a UI guy, I'm a UI person, this view model. I know that we use CG floats and CG points and CG sizes, we don't use ints, and I know that's what my view is going to expect. So I'm going to provide some intents, intent, intents, here, and these intents, I'm going to type mineral pass there with a snippet, these intents are going to essentially take arguments to add emoji like at location CG point and size CG float, or move emoji by offset CG size or scale emoji by a scale CG float. And then it's just going to turn around and access its array, but intifying them. See, int, int, we're doing int, we're making these things into ints. So this makes it so my view is gonna call these. It's not, it can't access emoji art directly, it's private. So it's gonna call these intent functions, intent, I intend to add an emoji, I intend to move emoji around, etc. Now notice we have an error here cannot convert value type emoji art, blah, blah, blah. It's because I'm using first index matching. Remember that cool function that we added via an extension to array that would look up something that's identifiable in an array of identifiables and find the index of it? And I'm doing this inside my view model because I also don't want my view to necessarily have to deal with indexes into the array. 
Now in Memorize, we used indexes into the array. And why did we use indexes into the array? Because we wanted to make changes to the array right in place. And we want to do the same thing here. So I'm gonna use indexes as an array here. But I'd really like for my view to just be able to use emoji art objects. And since they're identifiable, when they ask me to move one or to scale one, I'll just use this first index matching to look it up by the same identifiable that's here, that's in my emoji arts emojis list, right? Since these are identifiable. I'm just a little different API here than having the view have to say move emoji at index by offset. Now, of course, first, first index matching was something we added in Memrise, so it's not here. That's why it's complaining. Now, I actually put it in here, this file, which I'm going to drag in and which I provided to you, and I'm definitely going to copy this in, not link it in. And this extension not only has this first index matching, it has some other stuff you're going to see later on. Things that are just kind of utilities to make the code, this demo go a little quicker. And here's first index, but it's kind of interesting. I didn't add it to array. Here we did array in our memorize, but here I'm doing collection. Now, what is collection? Collection is a protocol that array implements. And since array implements that protocol, if I add an extension to it, array gets this. And so this will work with any collection. Now, why did I add it to collection here instead of array? Well, because set also implements a collection. So if I have a set, you know, the Swift UI set, not the set your homework three, Swift UI set, if I have one of those, I can do first index matching on it as well. And I'm even going to put this contains matching element also so that I can go look and see inside of a set or an array. Do you contain this thing by matching it? So I'm doing the same dollar zero equals element ID. Why did I do that, by the way? Well, I think when you do your assignment four and you're having to manage the selection of all those emojis, pretty good chance you might want to put them in a set. You probably could put them into an array, but sets are nicer than arrays because they manage identity and you never want the same emoji inside of your selection twice. And it's really easy to take them in and put them out in a set. So if you want to do that, you don't have to use this any of this stuff okay this is just provided uh, for your use if you want to but you might want to use set so uh, that's why i'm putting that here all right back to our view model now if we compile on this side it'll succeed and we have built our intents here for the emojis but there's one more intent i might have which is to set the background url which i'm going to do with drag and drop so i need one more here which is funk set background URL, and it's just going to take a URL here, URL, type URL, again, optional, we allow that. And we'll just have our emoji art.background URL uh, equal this URL. I'm gonna do one other little thing right here, which is that these URLs that you drag and drop from the internet, sometimes they're kind of funky URLs that have the actual URL for the image embedded inside of them using this thing called image URL right here, IMG URL. So I put a little thing on URL to extract that image URL if it's in there out of these more complicated URLs. So I'm going to call this little image URL var right here. Okay, and if by the way, if the image URL goes and looks in there, it can't find that funky little embedded thing, then it just returns the URL itself. So if you drag a normal URL in, that'll work as well. So now our view model is fully prepared to support the view in doing what the view wants to do. And so let's go over to our view and implement it. Now, the first thing I wanna implement is that drag and drop, All right? So over here in our simulator, we have our emoji art with Safari on here and I pick this up, I wanna be able to drop it in here. But notice it's really not working. I don't know, when we did it the first time, you noticed there was a little green plus. I'm not getting the green plus. And when I let go, it doesn't. It, fails to drop and goes back. So I wanted to drop and I want to draw here. I'm also not going to be yellow anymore. I'm going to use a white background. I think that looks better when we don't have an image or if our image is small, having white is going to look better than yellow. So let's do this drag and drop. Now, before we go do drag and drop, a couple of things. First of all, this only works in iOS 13.4. So if you're not on the latest Xcode, it's this part of this demo, it's just not going to work for you. The second thing is drag and drop 
it's a little bit of sophisticated API. It's very simple in Swift UI, but it uses some old technology from the Objective C world. And so don't be too caught up in the details of this. I want you to conceptually understand what's going on. I'm not going to ask you to do drag and drop in your homework, but it might be something you want to do in your final project. So this would be a good opportunity to understand it from that point of view. So drag and drop works very simply. You just call this method on any anywhere you want to be able to drop. You just say on drop and on drop takes some arguments here, which I'm going to type in and then we'll go over what they are. This first argument of this is saying, what kind of thing do you want to drop? And we want to drop public image. So public image is a what's called a URI. It specifies it's kind of a public agreement of the type of things that are images. Now we're looking for a URL, not an image, but if you drag and drop an image, very likely the provider of that image can also provide you its URL. So that is what we are going to have dropped. If I said in here that we wanted URLs dropped, we might get URLs from non-images that would be useless to us. So that's why the kind of thing we're looking to be dropping here is images. Now I'm not gonna talk about URIs. You can look up URIs in the documentation and understand what they are. We're actually gonna put another one in here in a few minutes, but it's pretty straightforward what a URI is. Now this is targeted, that is, Good thing we don't need this because the argument to this is what's called a binding. We're going to talk all about bindings next week, but we haven't talked about them yet. So if I had to explain it now, that would be bad. But all this is doing is basically letting us know when someone's dragging over us, not when they drop, but when they're dragging over. Luckily, I don't care. I just care when you drop that thing on me. And then the third argument to on drop is a function, a closure that has two arguments. One is providers. These are objects called NS item providers that provide the information that's being dropped. Now, this information being dropped might be big, like it might actually be an image. We're only gonna grab the URL, but you could grab the whole image and that's big. And so that transfer has to happen asynchronously. And we're gonna talk all about asynchrony in this demo. That's one of the primary things we're doing in this demo, but we're not, we're gonna gloss over the asynchrony here in these providers. I put again some code over here in these emoji art extensions to handle that stuff for us. And so don't worry about the asynchrony of this. We'll be talking about all about asynchrony in just a moment here. And then the second argument to this function is the location of the drop. Now for the background, we don't care where it was dropped. If you drop it anywhere in our big yellow currently rectangle, we're going to accept the drop. So we're not going to do anything with location for now, but eventually we're going to be dropping emoji on there and then we will care about location, but not yet. So what do we have to do in here? This function that we're given is supposed to return whether the drop succeeded. So I'm gonna create another little function for that called drop with the providers, pass those providers over, and it's gonna return whether the drop succeeded. So let's do that, it's a little private func here, drop providers. And these providers are an array of, as I said, NS item provider. This thing, I'm not gonna get into what this is. It's kind of an old objective C thing right there. And this returns a bool with it, which is whether the drop succeeded. All we need to do here because of that little extension I provided is go try and load a URL from these providers, see if these providers can provide me an actual URL. I'm asking for images, so they might not be able to, but usually they, they do. So I'm gonna let a little variable found equal providers, that's the array of those item providers, load up the first object of type URL. And when you specify a type as an argument, you say URL.self, that means the actual type URL. This is just a static var in the type URL that returns the type itself. And that works for instances, it also works for classes. So I'm able to do that. Then it calls a little function where it passes you the URL that it was able to find. Okay, this is just the URL that it was able to load the first one of. And all we need to do now is just ask our document, our view model, to please set the background URL to this thing that was just dropped on me. To make sure this is working, I'm gonna actually print out here, dropped URL, and print out what was dropped on us. So that we make sure that this dropping stuff is actually working before we go and figure out how to get this URL to show up. 
So I'm going to return this found whether or not the drop worked. That's what load first object returns whether it worked. That's it for drag and drop. This is really simple actually to do drag and drop. The complication comes a little in bit inside here. I encourage you if you want to understand drag and drop to go and see if you can figure out that code. So let's run and see if we're at least getting this print to happen. There we go. So I'm going to pick up our image, drag. I can already see something's different. The green plus that's appearing in the corner of the image. That's good. And drop. And it didn't do anything, of course, because we did, don't do anything with the URL. But it did do it. Here, down here saying dropped this URL. And in fact, this is one of those URLs that has this weird image URL thing embedded in it. See, this is the actual URL there. So it's a good thing we drag, you know, drag this thing out of here or this would not work. But this is great. So we have this URL. We set it as our documents background URL in our view model. Set background URL, which sets it in our model over here. And it's all is well. The only thing that's left to do now is to actually show that image. All right, we've got the URL of that image, but nowhere in our view right here do we actually show the image. All we show now is a rectangle edges ignoring the takes the drop. So how are we going to do that? I'm going to do that essentially by replacing this rectangle foreground color yellow here. I'm going to replace it by making it be a white rectangle. And overlaid on top of it is going to be an image that has our documents background image. Now, this line of code got a lot to unpack here. So let's unpack this piece by piece, what's going on here, because it's not actually going to work as is. The first thing is I took a white rectangle and I overlaid my image on top of it. Why did I do that? Why didn't I just make a Z stack here, right? Z stack overlays one view on top of another. And this has to do with sizing because we want our document view or whatever to be sized like it was a rectangle. Basically, we want to use all the space offered to it. We know that shapes take all the space offered to them, so that's what we want. We wouldn't want it to size it to the image because images, these views, image, they size themselves to the size of the image. So if you had a small image, we would have a small little view there, and we want it to be as big as possible. There's also something called background, which does the same kind of thing. Sizes to this and then puts whatever view is in here as a background for the other image. So this is all about sizing, using overlay or using background, right, right here, is all about the sizing behavior that you want. Okay, so otherwise, this is very much like a two view Z stack, essentially. So it's still not quite right here. We're still making our way through this. This image right here is take some argument, which is supposed to be this image, background image. But what is background image? We, we don't have a background image in our document. So let's add that. Let's go over here. I'm just going to add a var background image. And what type is this going to be? You'd think this might be of type image but it's not really a type image. We're creating the image view right here. So this type image, this is a struct, it's a view. Uh, really what we want to pass to it is an actual image. And an actual image in SwiftUI is represented by another thing called a UI image. Now, UI image, things that start with UI come from the old world, the previous to SwiftUI world. And this was such a great little object for dealing with images that they decided just to keep it. And they did the same thing with UI color. We saw that before that we have color. Color is kind of like a view, but UI color is the thing that actually represents colors. By the way, I talked about UI color being a view. UI color also can be a specifier right here, foreground color, colored out white. This is not a view. We're just specifying the color white. But color can act like a view. I could even say color dot white right here, and that's perfectly legal. This can be a view, and we also know that color can be shape style, fill color, stroke color in a shape. So color is kind of a chameleon, can be a lot of different things. But image here is the view. We can say UI image as the constructor for it and pass it a UI image, and that will make the image. 
and we're often doing this when we create an image we're going to learn other ways to create images but one way is we just pass it a ui image now this isn't quite working either and that's because this is not really want to be a ui image it's an optional ui image because again we might not have the background even if we have the url we might not have gone and got the image yet so this has to be able to be nil another important thing here is i want this to be private set only our view model is going to be fetching images from the internet our view is just going to look at whatever image arrives from the internet All right so our view gets the drop it sets the background URL, and then it's our view model that's gonna to have to go off and create this background image. So that creates a problem though, making this be an optional, because this image UI image constructor will not take an optional. This has to be non-optional. So it kind of makes me want to go in here and say, yeah, I'll have to say if self.document.background image does not equal nil, then I'll create this image right here and I'll force unwrap it. And this looks like, oh, this should work, except for the problem is that the argument to overlay, somewhat unusually, is not a view builder. This didn't have curly braces. There was no curly brace there. This is an actual view. This has to be a view. And we can't do ifs here. This is, this is supposed to be a view. This is an if statement, not a view. So if we want to do this nice view builder if stuff here we need to wrap this in something that does view builder and that's what group is really good at so if you find yourself having to pass a view somewhere but you need to do the if business around it go ahead and use a group because a group does not otherwise modify the layout or anything of that view so it's a nice little trick to use group all right excellent so everything's fine every no errors everything compiled the only problem is this is just always going to be nil. We never set this to anything. Our view model needs to take this URL and go fetch it on the internet. And when it gets the actual image and makes us a UI image out of whatever it finds over there on the internet, then it should automatically draw in our view, as long as we make this background image also published. We need to publish this so that whenever this changes, our view caused to redraw, and this whole thing will happen, this overlay will change, and we'll get to see that image. So sometimes when you're doing your view model, it can be easy to remember, oh yeah, of course my uh, model is uh, published, but there might be other things that your view model is doing that you want your view to react to. And we just do that without time published. Now, really, in some ways, the meat of today's lecture is how are we gonna fetch this background image and create a UI image from this URL down here. We're gonna do that in its own little function. I'm gonna call this function fetch background image data. And it's gonna go fetch the background image data and make a UI image out of it. So let's create that little function. It's a little private func here. This function's only job is to set this var. Once it sets this var to some UI image that it gets from this URL, it's, everything's just gonna update. Right, we have reactive UI. We've already built our UI to deal with this image. So it should all just happen automatically once we set this. So our goal here in the side here is to do one thing and one thing only, set this bar. All right, so what are we gonna do to do that? Well, the first thing is, if you're asking me to go fetch the background image data, I'm gonna set my current background image to nil. So I'm in the process of going out on the internet and getting something that might take quite a while. Maybe it's a big image or maybe the server that it's on is really slow. So in the meantime, I'm gonna clear the background image just to let you know, yeah, I know you changed the background image, you dropped something on me, I'm working on it. Really what we'd like to do is provide some UI to give some feedback that they're working on it. Maybe we will actually demo that. Uh, time permitting, but we definitely give, need to give some feedback that, yeah, we saw that drop and we're working on it. So that's that. And then if the URL that was dropped, which is this emoji art background URL now, if that's nil, then there's no need to go fetch anything. So I'm gonna put this if let URL around it. So I'm only doing any fetching on the internet if I'm actually got a URL to go look for. So fetching information, from a URL is really simple. 
there is a more sophisticated mechanism for doing this. We're going to do the simplest one because we want to really focus on the asynchronous programming that's going on here. But if you were really going to be downloading stuff from the internet, you would use URL session. And I'm not going to talk about the whole URL session API, but essentially it's just a closure based API. You pass closures to it, it goes and downloads stuff, it calls your closures when the downloads come back, or it'll call other closures when errors occur. But a simple way to fetch data is just to say if let image data equal try getting the data from the contents of that URL. This Data is just an object, a struct, and it has an initializer where you give it a URL and it will go out on the internet and get the data at that URL and return it. This can encounter all kinds of errors, internet timeouts, all kinds of things happening. So that's why we have to do this try. And in next week's reading assignment, you're gonna learn about try and thrown errors. I'm not gonna talk about it today, but just know that there are some constructors that you call and some functions that you call that have to be tried. And when you do this try with a question mark, it means try this, and if it fails, network timeout, whatever, just return nil. And since I'm doing F let, this in here won't get executed if this fails. Now, there's a huge problem with this line of code. This could take 10 seconds or two minutes, depending on what the timeout is. Uh, it's certainly probably going to take at least a half a second or a second. And during that time, my whole app is stuck waiting for this line of code to execute. And that is the rub. That we can never allow to happen. We can never call a function like this that blocks our code waiting for it to return because it can take seconds to do this. Never call that in the same thread of execution as all of our UI is happening. Otherwise, our app is going to freeze. And the user is going to be clicking and typing and trying to drag a new thing in. And I, I didn't want that URL. It's taking too long. No, they can't do anything. Our app, they can't even scroll their emoji at the top. It's all frozen because our app is sitting right here on this line of code for 10 seconds, 15 seconds, whatever. So how do we get around that? We use what we talked about in the slides, the dispatch mechanism. So I'm going to dispatch this code to a global queue and the quality of service I want here is called user initiated remember there's these different qualities of service I want user initiated because that's exactly what happened the user initiated a request here and so that right there that, that you've seen this dispatch queue global that gives me a global queue a, a queue that executes its code off the main queue not where the UI is and I'm going to asynchronously ask it to perform this function this function takes no arguments, return no arguments. I'm just going to ask it, please perform this function off on this queue, whatever it is, and, and I'll have nothing else to do with you. Just do it. So I'm going to put this inside here now. And this is great because now this is blocking still, still taking five seconds, but off on some background queue, not in the same queue where all the code for our UI is being executed. So that's great. Now the image data comes back, let's say, you know, let's say there was no error. And so this try uh, didn't return nil. And now I've got the image data. It's JPEG data or PNG data or some kind of data from the internet. And I need to turn it into a UI image because that's what I'm trying to do here is make this UI image here. And luckily UI image has a great way to do that. I could just say background image equals UI image with this data. This line of code has a humongous problem. Okay, just like this line of code was a problem that it blocked, and we fixed that by putting in a background queue. This one has a huge problem, which is that this is going to set this background image, which is going to cause this publishing to happen up here, which is going to cause our view over here to redraw, which means UI is going to be happening on a background thread. And that is never allowed. That is death. In fact, when you do that, your app is going to start behaving funny, might possibly even crash, and you're going to get a little purple warnings up here when you're running your app in Xcode that says, ah, you drew something outside the main queue. So we can never do something like this, a line of code that will cause drawing to happen on non-main threads. So how do we put this back on the main thread? We do it the exact same way that we put this code on this thread originally but we're gonna put it on instead of a background user initiated quality of service thread, we're gonna put this dispatch queue.main.
So let me do the same thing. I'm going to asynchronously post a little function closure to the main queue and say, go do this. Now, posting something asynchronously basically means it gets in the queue. That's why we call these queues to run. And there might be other threads that are posting these little function snippets to run on the main queue. So this guy might have to get in line. Something else is happening. In fact, one of those might be executing right now. The user just touched on something or scrolled their emojis at the top. So the main queue is busy. But when it's settled down, it's not busy, it'll start attending to its queue of requests and eventually it will execute this. This really is all there is to this multi-threaded programming. And it looks really simple and uh, it is, but it can get you in a little trouble as I will explain in just a minute. But this should be enough, right? We, we did what we said we were gonna do in this fetch background image data is we are setting the background image to the UI image from fetching that data. So let's see it in action. All right, here we go, pick this guy up. We drag him, he's turning green, that's good. Go over here and drop. Ah, whoa. It worked. Now, there was a slight delay. I don't know if you noticed that we dropped it, and it took about a half a second to draw this image. And during that half second, it was just going over the internet to whatever website this is on and pulling that image over. Let's talk a little bit, though, about these asynchronous things and why it's not always as straightforward as you might think. I'm going to describe a scenario that goes on here, and you can see why this code is actually not quite right. Let's say that I drag and drop an image from a really slow server, and it's gonna take 15 seconds. And after about three or four seconds as a user, I'm like, ah, I'm tired of waiting for that image. And you go to another one, a fast server, and you drag a new thing in. And of course, the fast server gives it to you right away, and boop, you display it. And so now it's displaying, and maybe you go on, and you're like, oh, I'm gonna add some emoji to it. And then oh, the other one finally returns. And what's it gonna do? Boom, reset your background image. So that is really unexpected for the user. I dragged something in. I think it failed because it took too long. So I dragged something else in. It was quick. It got there. And then 10 seconds later, boom, the old thing comes in. So that we never would want to happen. Now, it's easily protectable against, which is just when I go back here to set this background image, I'm going to make sure that this data that I got is for the background URL that the user still wants. I can just do in here and say, if the URL that I just fetched, right, that's this URL that I got right here, if it equals the emoji arts background URL, then I'll go ahead and load it up. But if it's some other URL that I got 15 seconds ago, then I'm just going to do nothing. I'm going to ignore it. I still fetched it. It still arrived, but I'm not going to waste my time making an image and certainly not going to blast it in front of the user. So this kind of minor thing right here is the kind of thing you have to be able to protect against and be careful about when you have this asynchronous program. You can't just blithely be posting back and forth and not thinking about what if things like this take a very long time and then it's another one comes by. Make sure that didn't break anything. I'm sure it won't. Drag our image in here. Boop, there it is, working great. Now that we have our image working here, let's make it so we can pick these up and drag them in here, drag our emojis in here. So that's both making it so we can drop little texts on our view here, but also we gotta make it so these things are draggable. So then we're doing drag and drop with this one. So let's do the drop side of it first because we already know how to drop and it's actually really easy to drop the emoji as well over here in our view. So here's on drop. Right now on drop just lets you drop the image for the background. Now I'm gonna make it so that on drop also can drop a text because our emojis are just little snippets of text. So public.text is the URI for text. Now in this case, I do need the location. If you drop an emoji, I need the, let's get rid of this URL printing right there. Uh, in this case, I do need the location. So we're gonna have to do it. Now the location that's provided here when we drop I think it's actually a bug, but it's currently in global coordinate systems, the coordinate system of the entire device, basically, not the little coordinate system of our little, you know, color here with an image in front of it, which that's bad for us. We need to convert it to do that. 
So I provided a little extension to Geometry Reader right here, Geometry Proxy, that can convert from some coordinate space. And we're going to use this little function to convert this location that we're given here from global coordinates to our views coordinate system. Pretty straightforward. I'm just going to create a little var here, location. And I'm going to use that geometry proxy thing that I just showed you to convert that location that we we're given from the global. So this is converting this location from global coordinates. Now there's another conversion I have to do. This location is in iOS coordinate system. Remember the iOS coordinate system? It's the upper left is zero, zero. My emoji art, I'm going to have its X and Y be offset from the center. Not just to be different, but I actually think it's easier to store it this way. And so we need to convert from iOS coordinates, 0, 0 in the upper left, to this coordinates, 0, 0 in the middle. Our location equals a CG point, which at X is the location you gave us in the iOS coordinates, but minus the geometry readers proxy size dot width divided by two and the y is the location you gave us in y minus the geometries size dot height by two now here i'm using my geometry reader both here to convert that and my geometry reader here to convert from global so i clearly need my geometry reader here so let's put geometry reader around this now, the last thing we need to do is have this drop handler not only take the providers, but it also needs to take the locations. So let's enhance this drop to take the location, comma, at location, which is the CG point. Now in here, right now, I'm looking for the first object to be a URL. So if I don't find that, if not found, then I'm gonna go and see if found equals the providers load up objects of type string.self. So here I was loading the first object of type URL. Here I'm loading all objects of type string. And that has a little argument here, which is a string in. And this is gonna call this little function for all the strings that it found in there. And I'm gonna assume all my strings are emojis. Now this does mean I could drag a non-emoji string on and that it's going to work, but that's okay. So here, what do I want to do? If this happens, I'm just going to use my intent right here, this document add emoji. And the emoji is the string that was dropped on me. And the point is the location that was dropped at. And the size is the default emoji size. So we're going to have things, emojis that are dropped be this default emoji size, the same size, same size we use with our scroll view at the top. Now this is complaining because let found is a let. Let's just make it be a var now we're searching for two things here and this is all we need to do on the drop side we got the location and we're just checking for them and adding them using this intent right remember everyone remember this intent that we added over here add emoji the last thing we want to do is be able to drag our emojis out here are the emojis that are in the palette to do this is incredibly easy we're just going to say on drag now on drag takes a function and this function just needs to return the things to drag. And these need to be NS item providers. Remember NS item providers are what these providers are down here when we drop. So then these need to be a provider. So I need to create a provider that essentially provides this emoji right here. And NS item provider almost has the one I want and something for that object it's called. And this item provider object, and it will take this object, and for certain known types like strings and images, it will per create an item provider here. Unfortunately, this is old Objective C world code uh, imported into Swift UI, and so we have to put this as NS string on here. This is because item providers only take these old NS things. You see, it starts with NS, this starts with NS. I'm not going to talk about as right now, we'll talk about it later. What it, means but it essentially converts this emoji which is of type string these are strings into this ns world so that ns item provider can do it and of course we don't re need return there actually so let's see this works we've got our drag up here we got our drop down here 
Let's see if we can do it. Let's start with this background, make sure that didn't get broken. That oh, works fine. And let's maybe drag the earth down here. Oh, I see a green plus. Oh, it didn't display. So our drag and drop appears to be working because we got the green plus, but we don't actually draw our emojis that are dropped anywhere in our UI here. We drop our we draw our palettes up here, but we don't actually draw the emojis that are dropped. We just did, need to put that on top of this white overlaid image. So I'm gonna make a Z stack, stack these two things on top of each other, this guy. And this second thing that I'm gonna put in the Z stack here is just for each of all of the emojis in my document. And for each one of these things, I'm gonna to have to make a view to draw it. Now. I don't currently have any var that gives me the emojis in the document. And if you look over in my document, my model is private, so I can't look at the emoji art. So I'm gonna need another var here, which is emojis. And it's gonna be of type array of emoji art dot emoji. And this thing is just going to return my emoji art emojis. Since this is a get only computed var, this is a read only version of these emoji art. Okay, that's kind of exactly what my view model here wants to do is provide a read only access to the model since it provides mutable access via its intent functions. So inside here, these emojis are identifiable. That's great. We made emoji identifiable and to display them, it's just text of the emoji. And that's all we need to do. The only thing about that is we want to set the font to be the size and we want to set the position of this thing to be wherever the position is in the model. So we're gonna to have to do both of those things. I'm gonna create little functions to do that. So let's have the font return self.font for this emoji. And then we'll have the position return self.position for this emoji. And for that, because of the coordinate system space between zero, zero in the middle or upper left, I'm gonna to have to pass this geometry dot size in there. So let's make these two little functions and then I think we'll be done here. Font in position, private func font for emoji, emoji art dot emoji. This is going to return a font. And this one's pretty simple to do. We're just going to do font dot system size and we need to get the size. Now this size is actually in the emoji as size but this is an int, right? Size is an int in our model over here. And I really don't want my view to ever have to deal with ints. So I'm gonna put something in my view model, just like I did all these things, doing a little interpretation here into floats and points. I'm gonna do the same thing over here for the font size and for the location as well. But I'm gonna do it in an unusual way. I'm gonna create an extension to emoji art.emoji. And I'm gonna add the var font size, which is a CG float, and just takes a CG floatized version of self.size. Now, this might feel like we're violating MVVM here. I just added a CG float var to my model, but this is not violating MVVM because this code is in my view model right here. It's not in the model. I'm adding it to something that's in my model, but this code, this line of code right here is here in my view model. And that makes it perfectly legal. View model is allowed to do CG float, no problem. I can do the same thing here with location, which is a CG point. And I could make that a CG point where the X is a CG float X and the Y is CG float sub Y. So now I've made it so that we don't have to deal with ints ever in our view. Our view model is just being a good view model, okay, by interpreting the model for us. So over here then I can just say that the size equals this emoji's font size, and this will be a CG float. And for the position, similarly, private func position, for emoji, emoji art dot emoji in size, CG size. That's gonna give the CG point, which is where that thing goes. That's just gonna make a CG point where we convert, again, 
to that zero, zero in the middle instead of zero, zero in the upper left. So that's the X being emojis location dot X plus plus size dot width divided by two. And the Y is the emojis location dot Y. Again, this emoji dot location, those are CG points coming from our view model there plus size dot height divided by two. Now we might, you might have some more conversion going on uh, later when you start allowing these things to be positioned, moved around. And what do we got here? Oh yes, of course, it's not just emoji, it's emojis text. So let's take a look. Hopefully just for each all of our text in there. Again, let's make a nice background here. Let's pick this up, have it in here. Woo, we got it. Have a little baseball, yay. Apple on top of the house. Nice. Now your homework assignment next week is going to be a make it so you can click on these to select them and then drag them around. Okay. Or even pinch, which you can do on your simulator by holding down the option key and pinch to zoom in and out on them. So to get you started on that and understanding how to do that in the next lecture, we're going to make it so that we can drag around and pinch the whole image. So I'm going to let you drag around and pinch the whole image. You're going to make it so you can drag around and pinch the little emoji there. So that's it for this lecture. And uh, we'll start off the next lecture with a little bit of slides about how to do these gestures, pinches and drags and all that stuff. And then we'll dive right back into this demo and make some more progress. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.